mostly Yaron is speaking about free markets, but today he's speaking about free speech. And you might wonder uh, why. And because, uh, I mean, haven't we achieved free speech already? But uh, I want to speak about my personal experience with that. So I'm living here for six years now in Georgia, and I never had any problems to speak my mind. I was always totally open, both uh, privately and in the media even. I, you know, I have published a lot of articles in Georgia, and I never ever felt that I have to restrict myself. I always could speak my opinion. Now, as some of you may know, I'm moving to Europe, I'm moving to the UK, and the first thing I did when I started sending applications to Europe was deleting my Facebook account. Because if you don't agree with certain mainstream opinions in Europe, if you don't agree with opinions on mainstream opinions on immigration, if you, for example, if you are very pro-Israel, as I am, then it may be problematic, it may be a disadvantage for your career if you share these opinions. And so I got rid of my Facebook account. And I never had this need here in Georgia. We'll give you another example. So I'm, I'm originally from Germany. And uh, here in Georgia, you have a television broadcaster, Gustavi II, which is explicitly critical of the government. I mean, OK, the government tried to shut it down, but so far they didn't succeed. And compare that to Germany. In Germany, in 2015, when, when one million people were invited to the country, in the media there was just one opinion, and that opinion was aligned with the government opinion. So in Germany, I don't feel as free as I feel here, and once I move back to Europe, I will have to restrict myself much more. Therefore, I think it's a very important topic, and I'm very happy that we have Jaron Bruck here, and um, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, Free speech, as hot as, as hot as it is to imagine, and I, and I have to admit, I never thought I would be giving talks about free speech, because to a large extent, I took it for granted. Well, of course, we can speak. I mean, particularly in America, where I live today, it's part of the Constitution. There is a First Amendment. You, you're allowed to say pretty much whatever you want to say. It's always been viewed as an absolute. As long as you're not inciting for violence, as long as you're not committing fraud, you basically can say whatever you want to say. And that is always, in America, being taken for granted. Particularly, I would say, since the 1960s, where there was a big movement on campuses to emphasize the idea that everybody has a right to speak. And yet, over the last couple of years, we have seen, particularly at universities, the bastions of free speech, one would think, we have seen more and more and more restrictions on what one can say, uh, how one can say it. Many speakers in America who are invited to speak on campuses have been, uh, the, the invitation for them to come to speak has been rescinded. They've been asked not to come to the campus because of fear of demonstrations against them. On a number of occasions, one at Berkeley, but at a number of other universities, there have been violent demonstrations when specific speakers have come onto campus. And we're not talking about crazy, really out there, nutty people. We're talking about somebody like, and I don't know how familiar he is here, but in America, very familiar, Charles Murray, who is a conservative, um, conservative, sometimes he calls himself a libertarian, but, you know, not nutty, extreme, crazy, right? Pretty mainstream, conservative, libertarian type, uh, very prestigious, written a lot of books, and yet violent demonstrations have prohibited him from speaking at some universities. We're talking about somebody, you know, like Ben Shapiro, again, a conservative. So everybody on the right today has been restricted, or a woman uh, some of you might have heard of, Ayan Hosi Ali, who, uh, who is originally from Sudan, who escaped an arranged marriage at the age, I think, of 14 or 16, and ultimately landed up in the Netherlands and today lives in the United States, is very critical about certain practices in Islam, but is a very educated, very well-spoken, very reasonable person, and yet 
she is not invited to speak on campuses in which she is, there are demonstrations, there is violence, and she is prohibited from speaking. More and more, this is the case on, on university campuses in the United States. In Europe, things are actually worse. Because in the United States, we have a First Amendment. We have part of our Constitution. It says that you have a right to free speech. In Europe, there is no guarantee of free speech. And many European countries today have what are called hate speech laws that basically say that the certain type of speech, hate speech, that you cannot engage in that you cannot say, otherwise you go to jail. Now we all know the tragedy that happened at the, uh, at the, at the offices of the cartoon uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, was it two years ago now, or a year and a half ago, where, where a number of cartoonists were murdered by Islamic terrorists. Charlie Hebdo was in trouble already before that happened with the French government who was trying to shut them down, was trying to silence them. Nobody talks about that. And then their freedom of speech was ultimately violated with violence by them being murdered. You know, going back even further to 2005, the publication of the Danish cartoons in Denmark that caused demonstrations and riots all over the world, violence because of speech. And Governments all across the West did very little to protect those who engaged in writing those cartoons those, or publishing the cartoons. And indeed, in the United States, newspapers and in Europe, newspapers refused to publish the cartoons even though it was news. People were rioting all over the world because of cartoons. And American newspapers were too afraid to publish the cartoons and self-censored themselves because of fear of violence, because they knew their government wouldn't protect their right to free speech. Actually, you can go back even further to 1989, when uh, the Iranian Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khomeini at the time, put out a fatwa to kill Salman Rushdie for expressing anti-Islamic opinions, for being an apostate basically put out a, what in the Mafia we call a contract on Salman Rushdie. And what's interesting is that the response of the West wasn't, how dare you? In our countries, you can write whatever you want. In our countries, we defend free speech to the end, and we will protect not only Salman Rushdie, but the publishers and everybody else associated. No. In the West, we apologized. Yes, it's not good to offend religion. Yeah, we have a right to free speech, but it's really not nice of Solomon Rushdie to have written what he wrote. We're talking about Solomon Rushdie, who is a well-known novelist, not a provocateur, not a, a political party. We're talking about an author of, of you know, significant novels of the 20th and 21st century. He had to go into hiding. In the United States, bookstores were firebombed that carried his books, and the West did nothing to protect the free speech of this individual. They didn't even stand up for his right to protect it. So since 89 at least, we have seen in my view a slow deterioration and a chipping away of the right to speak. Uh, just a personal experience, last year, uh, was it last year, in November, I was giving a talk at Exeter University, which is in England, in the southwest of England. and. Uh, the speech was titled exactly what the speech is titled, Free Speech and Western Civilization. And a number of people arrived at the speech and started yelling at me. And they would not let me talk. Every time I started talking, they would stand up and start yelling and chanting and refuse to allow me to speak. Security had to come. They had to clear out the room. And of course, it was perfect because I was giving a speech on free speech, so it was perfect to see people obstruct free speech. I didn't have to motivate to talk. Um, but you're seeing more and more of this. And there's always been people demonstrating. There have always been people trying to shout speech down. 
The difference is that today we tolerate it like never before. In the New York Times recently, just as one example, but there are many, a, a, a well-known professor, American professor, wrote that since speech can cause psychological damage to students, and therefore it is equivalent to violence, speech cannot be an absolute right. But So now, in America, we're equating speech, words that I say, with violence, a fist in the face. Once you do that, again, free speech is gone. Now, the important question is, really, who cares? Right? So what? Right? Why is speech important? Particularly, why is speech important when we're talking about, you know, re relatively radical people like me? Um, or Anne Hersey Ali, or Charles Murray, I mean, eh, okay, so they don't get to speak. Big deal. What's, why is this an issue? Well, I would argue that this is the, the idea of free speech. The idea of free speech for everybody. Even people you hate, even people you despise, is a core and necessary value of civilization. That without it, civilization will break down and always has in history broken down. Western civilization, the civilization we all enjoy, here in Georgia, in Europe, in America, in vast parts of Asia, in South America, I consider all of that Western civilization, is grounded to a large extent on the idea of free speech, on the idea of your right to communicate without being silenced through violence. So to me, this is a, this is a core value of civilization. And, and, and let me just give you an example of what I mean by speech that's hateful and offensive. And, you know, so I'm, I'm a, I, I really believe in free speech, right? So as you know, some of you might know, I was born in Israel. So, you know, from an ethnic perspective or heritage perspective, I'm Jewish. The first laws against free speech in Europe, in the modern era, were instituted in Germany after World War II. And what kind of speech did they exclude? Holocaust deniers. If you're a Holocaust denier, you go to jail in Germany, in Austria, and in many countries in Europe today. Because clearly, I mean, Holocaust denial is offensive. I'm offended by anybody who denies the Holocaust. I have family members who died there. But, but once you accept that idea that if you're offended, you can silence somebody, where do we stop? I know lots of people who are offended my, by my advocacy for capitalism and freedom. I know many people who are offended by lots of things that I do, that you do. What's the standard? Who gets to decide the standard? And this is where I think going back in history is really important. If we think about Europe and, and, and the world, really, before the Enlightenment, before the 17th century, who got to decide what speech was allowed or not allowed? Well, it was the church and the king, or the queen, or the whatever, right? It was the authorities decided what was allowed and what was not allowed. It's the authorities that dictated what constituted science that was acceptable and what constituted science that was unacceptable. What constituted acceptable philosophy and what constituted unacceptable philosophy. And if you happen to practice science that was unacceptable, for example, God forbid, claiming that the earth went around the sun, not the sun around the earth. What happened to you? Well, if you were Galileo, you got lucky because you only were put under house arrest. If you were, came earlier than Galileo, you typically got burnt at the stake. Not so lucky. What about philosophers who might have claimed that Maybe God didn't intervene in every aspect of our life and had more of a Aristotelian conception of God as a, a, a first mover, but otherwise, you know, not intervening in everything. You know, really radical. What happened to them? 
Well, they had to basically stay in hiding like Solomon Wushti. They had to publish their articles with anonymous names. And if you read one of their books, if you were found with a book by Spinoza, the philosopher, you could get into real trouble. You could land up in jail, you could land up dead, because this was heretical. These were heretics. So, historically, by the way, there are two seats up front here, if, uh, if anybody wants to sit, there are two seats here. History is full of authoritarians, whether in the name of religion or in the name of the state, dictating what we can think, dictating what we can say, dictating what is offensive, <clears throat> dictating what is acceptable. In the 18th century, thinkers started to challenge this idea. They started to recognize that the attribute that makes us human, the attribute that is most important for human life, is what? What's another name for the, for the Enlightenment? The age of what? The age of reason. The age of reason. They started to recognize the human reason. Again, this is really them rediscovering Aristotle and understanding Aristotle. Aristotle defined man as the rational being. An age of reason is an age in which we understood that reason is our means for knowing the world. Reason is what should guide our behavior. Reason is how we know things. The first, in my view, the first thinker of the Enlightenment, really, the first thinker of the Age of Reason is who? Early 17th century, uh, 18th century, sorry. Isaac Newton, in many respects, is the guy who popularizes this idea. Because think about it. Before Isaac Newton, what was our understanding of the physical world? What moved planets and objects and everything? Well, basically, God's will. We had no understanding of physics, of science, of how things moved around. The notion was that real knowledge, real knowledge of truth came to us, not through reasoning, not through figuring stuff out, but through revelation. And we needed authorities to have that revelation, because you know what? We're too stupid to actually get the revealed knowledge directly. This is Plato. If you know a little bit of philosophy, Plato says all of us live in a cave. And we just see shadows. We don't really see actual reality. You need the philosopher kings, the philosophers, to actually get the revelation of what's real, of what's true, of what's actual knowledge. Aristotle, of course, comes and says, no, all of us have the faculty of reason. All of us can think rationally. All of us can know truth directly through observation of reality. And Newton says, yeah, Aristotle's right. Here are the laws of physics that actually explain all these things. Here's some formulas where you can predict the movement of planets, you can predict the movement of objects, and suddenly everybody can understand physics. It's not that hard. I know, you know, if you didn't understand physics, Newtonian physics, it's, you, didn't, you had a bad teacher. Because it's not that hard. And people in the 18th century kind of woke up and said, wow, cool. We can understand the world. We don't need authorities to tell us what the world's about. We can actually understand it. Here, here and, and there's a system. And it, it, there's a way to understand it. It's called science. And this is called the age of science, the age of reason, the enlightenment. And of course, if you can reason, if you can think, if you can discover truths, then it's important for you to have the freedom to act on those truths. Because otherwise, what's the point? What's the point of thinking if you can't act on those thoughts? And one of the actions that we engage in when is expressing those ideas, expressing those thoughts, expressing those truths, whether in writing, whether in speech. And they came to understand that it's important for the development, for the discovery of truth, the development of science in all human realms to give people the freedom to express those truths. And yeah, some people, some people will express lies. Some people will express things that we don't like. 
But what they, what they understood during this period was that the last thing we want is an authority to decide what is a lie and what is a truth, what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, what is offensive and what is unoffensive. That the real authority is you, me, every one of us. We get to decide. Not the Pope or the King or the President or the government, but we get to be exposed to whatever ideas are out there and we get to decide using our own reason, using our rational faculty, what is true and what is not. And are we going to be exposed to offensive ideas? Oh yeah, lots of them. I mean, half the stuff I hear in the news is offensive to me. I mean, we're offended all the time. So what? Grow up. Right? Stand up, you know, if you, if you disagree, you know, it's a good opportunity to, to get better at expressing yourself, your disagreement, to understand why you disagree. Sometimes the offensive speech is actually true speech. And you'll have an opportunity to rethink your own thoughts and re-examine your own beliefs. But to give somebody else the authority to decide for yourself, to decide what is right for you, is to accept authoritarianism in everything. It's to deny your capacity to think things through. It's to deny your capacity to deal with your own emotions. I'm offended. Big deal. But that's where we're heading. We're heading towards a world in which we're going to have authorities make decisions for us. What we are grown up enough to understand or not to understand. To be exposed to or not to be exposed to. You're seeing this, you know, with most of the, most of the action on this on American campuses is from the left. But you're also seeing it in the way Donald Trump talks about this. Because Trump, the President of the United States, I still, I still find a hard time actually saying that. Um, I mean, continuously attacks the media, the instrument by which information is disseminated. Now, the media is biased. We all know the media is biased. You know, we have the example of Germany, certainly in the United States, it's very similar. But when a political authority, when somebody in the position of the president tells us this media is not okay and this media is okay, and the media that's okay happens to be the media that praises him constantly, and this is a president with the power of the state behind him, this is very, very, very dangerous for the idea of true free speech. Presidents should not get in the middle of the debate about the media. You know, they have opinions, they can express them. Politicians should stay away from commenting on what media is okay and which media is not. Again, it's our job to make those decisions as consumers of that information, not the job of government to regulate it. So if we believe in reason, then we have to believe in our ability to express our ideas, and as a consequence be exposed to things that offend us. And think about it this way, every new idea, every new idea that's true, put aside the false ideas, every new idea that's true has offended somebody. I mean Newton, Galileo, and many of the scientists offended the church, and offended people who were deeply religious. Now, they got over it. They ultimately found a way to, 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 to live with it. But when the first ideas first came out, they were viewed as offensive ideas. When uh, Locke, when John Locke, the great British philosopher, articulated the case for individual rights, articulated the case for individual liberty, individual freedom, he offended the church. He actually, at some point, had to escape England to Amsterdam because he was worried that a Catholic king would kill him, and he only came back to, the, to, to, the, to Britain after the Catholic king was deposed and a different king was put in place. Amsterdam has always been a place of, of freedom. It's always been a place where yeah, ideas were accepted. Voltaire, in the 19th century, because he was critical of religion, had to escape Paris of all places. 
and he went to Amsterdam in order to escape death threats. And yet, John Locke today, we all know, was one of the great philosophers of all time. And yet, at the time, what he said was offensive, because truth, if it's new, is always going to offend the people who believed in whatever it was that they believed before the truth was discovered. I mean, think of a modern example. Everybody know Uber? Right? Do you have Uber here? No, no Uber in Tbilisi? Uber. Uber offends whom? Taxi drivers. And Uber, Uber, Uber. Do you have an Uber here? Taxi yes, you have Uber. Taxi okay, you have a you have a compromised Uber. <laughs> Every new technology offends an old technology. Everything new is upsetting to those people who hold the old ideas. But the only way to advance is to continuously to discover truth, to express truth, and don't we want to be exposed to it? Don't want we know when a new truth has been discovered? The price for that, if you will, is that, yeah, we're going to be exposed to a lot of falsehood. We're going to be exposed to a lot of nonsense. But I think we're all adults. I think we're all capable of figuring out ourselves, of evaluating, of judging. And what we don't need are authorities to tell us what we should believe, what we should think, what is true, what is not, and how to, you know, and what can be expressed and what cannot. If you attack speech, ultimately what you're attacking is thought. Ultimately what you're attacking is reason. If you attack speech, what you're attacking is fundamentally the right of the individual to judge for himself, to think for himself, and therefore you are attacking individualism. Now in my view, the two foundational ideas of Western civilization, the two foundational ideas that created the civilization that we have today that is being enjoyed by billions of people around the world, the two foundational ideas are reason, capacity of human beings to know the world around them through their rational faculty and individualism. The individual is an end in itself. The individual is the standard for morality. The individual is determining the course of his own life. Individualism and reason are both under assault when we assault free speech. Now, why do we ban physical force? What is the difference between physical force? Because speech is not physical force. Speech is not me punching you in the face. Why have all, since the Enlightenment, all thinkers agreed, at least the Enlightenment thinkers, that physical force should be banned? And that's the job of the government. The primary job of government is to protect us from people who would use physical force against us. What's different about force? Force is the one thing that can destroy a capacity to think, to reason, to discover truth. When Galileo was put out of house arrest, what was his motivation to do more thinking, to discover more truth? Zero. He was now being penalized for using his mind. When somebody puts a gun to your back and says, from now on, you must live with the idea that 2 plus 2 equals 5. And if you don't, I will shoot you. You can't think. This is why, by the way, free countries, countries in which we have freedom, advance technologically, advance economically, advance from the perspective of innovation, much more than authoritarian countries. Because to discover new technologies, to discover new truths, People must be free to use their mind as they see fit. Otherwise, we stagnate. Otherwise, we die. Violence is the antithesis of reason. To defend, to, to, to defend reason, to defend the human mind, means to reject violence. Speech is not violent. I can tell you nonsense. Some of you might think I'm saying it right now. Right? I can talk nonsense, and you can, you can ignore it. 
You don't have to pay attention. There's no way I can impose my nonsense onto your mind. You have to choose whether I'm saying something that's right or not, whether what I'm saying is true or false. There's no way I can impose my ideas on you the same way I can impose my fist on you. So there is a fundamental difference between violence, which indeed needs to be banned from society, and speech, which cannot and should never be banned in a society. Okay, so just to summarize, and then I'll take your questions. The great achievement of Western civilization is the rediscovery from the Greeks of the role of reason in human life and the importance of the individual politically. That's what's led to the, you know, the prosperity we have today. Anybody ever seen a, do you know the graph of, uh, of uh, per capita income or per capita uh, wealth? Ever seen this graph? I'm going to draw it in the air. So, you know, so this is, this is going to be wealth or income per capita, and this is time. So 10,000 years ago, we're going to start 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, people made under $3 a day on average, almost everybody. And this is true for about 10,000 years. I mean, there were periods where it went up a little bit, Rome, and then it went down during the Dark Ages. And then it stayed like this, at $3 a day or under. And then what happened? Suddenly, out of nowhere, it went like that. Like that. And what is that date where it went like that? Anybody know what that date is? Industrialization. Yeah, industrialization. Well, what, what was the date and, and why did industrialization happen? What was the date? We suddenly went like that. When did we start industrializing? 1770? Well, I happen to like 1776. For two reasons. Two reasons. One, because a great book in economics was written. At the time, the first real defense of markets. What was that? Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, was published in 1776. But what else happened in 1776? The Declaration of Independence was written, in my view, the most important political document in human history. <coughs> because it is the first political document in human history to recognize the individual's right to his own life. Which means the right for individuals to act on their own behalf, in pursuit of their own values, free of intervention, free of force. And as long as you're not violating somebody else's rights, you can exercise, you can pursue your values that you deem necessary for your own life. You have a right to liberty. What's a right to liberty? It's the right to think whatever you want to think. It's the right to speak whatever you want to speak, to write whatever you want to write. It's the first political document to recognize this. Based on the ideas of John Locke, based on the ideas of the Enlightenment, but the Founding Fathers of America put it in writing in a political document and established a country based on this specific principle. No country in human history had this in its founding document. To this day, very few have it. And then finally, every individual has a right, an inalienable right. Inalienable means nobody can take it away from you, not even a majority. To pursue your own happiness. Individualism, your life, your thoughts, your happiness, that's what's important. America was the culmination of the Enlightenment, the political culmination of the Enlightenment. It was finally a political entity established in order to recognize the value of reason and the value of individualism. When we lose free speech, we lose those values, we lose the promise that the Enlightenment provided us. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sid. It's a great honor to meet you in person, finally. Uh, I've seen a video of yours on YouTube suddenly uh, a couple of years ago. And I have Thank two you. questions for you. One that regards what you talked about today, and second, uh, the general application okay. to capitalism and everything. So, my first question is like, uh, there is a current discussion right now in America about uh, statues of some yes. uh, Civil War era. Uh, 
Assistant Attorney General. Yes. And I want you to ask what you think about that. Even though those items do actually do have like a, a connotation, it was directed around the time of the uh, the the the, the segregation area, not not after slavery. It was after the segregation era, segregation period. Yeah, they were they were erected in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Yes. So, uh, what do you think about that? That's okay, so let me, let me take the first question, then you can ask the second one. So, I am very sympathetic to the idea that the monuments should go to museums. I would find it, and I do find it, offensive to, uh, to be in front of a monument celebrating uh, slavery, which I think every one of these monuments does. Because what did, uh, what did uh, what's his name, General um, Lee, Lee, you know, what did, what did he fight for? First of all, I committed treason by seceding from the United States and fighting the, the, the government. And second, he fought for slavery, because the only reason the South seceded from the North was to maintain slavery. Now, I'm fine with taking those down. Now, do you have a right to stand up and say, on your own property, on your own radio station, any way you want that's yours, I'm for slavery, I believe in slavery, slavery's fine. Sure you have a right. Do you ever wait in your own home to, 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 to have a Confederate flag or to put up a statue of Robert E. Lee? Absolutely, that's free speech. But we're talking about public monuments. We're talking about government space that is public space representing the views, in a sense, of the government entity. Now, I don't, I'm not much for public property generally. I don't believe there should be any, right? I think everything should be private. I think that solves a lot of the problems we face. But I can certainly understand why in certain communities they would get rid of these. Now, I would leave it to the local communities. I don't, need, I don't think you need a federal law to say get rid of the statues. Local communities can make these decisions and people can then decide whether they want to live in those communities or not. I, for one, would be horrified by having a, you know, a beautiful sculpture of Lee on my way to work every day. Uh, you know, celebrating slavery. So I understand completely people who want to get rid of those monuments. I, I commend those states that got rid of their Confederate flag. I think the fact that a Confederate flag would be flying next to the American flag, I don't know, in the State House of South Carolina or North Carolina, is offensive and ridiculous. Again, this is a government institution, not a private home. Private home, you can fly whatever you want to fly. But a government institution cannot. So, I, so I'm for taking those down from government institutions. But again, I would leave it to localities. And I certainly don't advocate for the anarchy of mobs going around pulling statues down. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's violence. And, and they have no right to do it. Generally, I'm opposed to mobs. And well, my second question is uh, about one of the things that you like. You advocate for capitalism and uh, limited government. Yes. I was fully convinced when I saw a video of yours four years ago until I got to the college and I was introduced to philosopher John Rawls and how that. Was. Oh my god. <laughs> so, my question is why is it that moral for society to correct us and the differences and starting points of people and, and to, for that to address inequality? Okay, so this is John Rawls' argument for egalitarianism. The fact is, we are born unequal. By the way, tonight I'm giving a talk on this topic. Uh, where, we, where am I talking tonight? Yeah. At the University of Georgia tonight, I'm giving a talk just on this. So I'll give you the, 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 the short version. The fact that I was born with more opportunities than you, let's say. I don't know if that's even true, right? But the fact that I was born with more opportunities than any one of you does not make me guilty of anything. It's not my fault. I, you know, it's not my responsibility. Let's say I was born with money. Well, I was born with money. That's a metaphysical fact. Now, what you want to do, what John Rawls wants to do, is force me to give up those things in order to benefit somebody else. By what right? Oh, good. Well, sure, not all of it. He wants to keep me alive so I can keep producing so he can steal more of my stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> my point is. You're not born guilty. I don't buy original sin, not in its religious version and not in its secular version. You're not born guilty because you're born rich. You're not born guilty because you're born with whatever problem exists out there. We love original sin for some reason. Christianity's really inculcated this. What I want is a world that maximizes opportunities, that everybody has as many opportunities as are possible. A world like that does not engage in stealing. 
which is what redistribution of wealth is. Redistribution of wealth is stealing. Look, it's immoral for society to do anything that it's immoral for an individual to do. You don't gain morality by having a group, by having a mob. We all recognize that it's immoral of a poor person to come up to me in the street with a gun and steal my money. The fact that all of you want to vote to take my money and give it to this poor person doesn't make it any less stealing. It is stealing. It's just stealing by democratic vote. But democratic vote does not make something bad good. It does not make an evil justifiable. Remember the most famous vote to silence somebody? Talk about free speech, right? Is Athens. And they didn't like what Socrates was saying. Socrates was going around and he was corrupting the youth because he was challenging their religious ideas. So basically, Athens got together and voted. What should we do with it? How do we silence Socrates? Well, there's only one way to silence Socrates. He's a philosopher. He, he speaks. How do we silence him? By killing him. They gave him a chalice of poison, which he drank because he too believed in democracy. I don't believe in democracy if that's what democracy is. <coughs> If you get to vote on how much money I get to keep, I don't believe in it. If you get to vote on what I can say and what I can't say, I don't believe in it. I believe in voting, but I don't believe in absolute democracy. And this is the whole idea of individual rights. The whole idea of Locke's individual rights is that they're inalienable. Nobody can take them away. If I have a right to my property, you don't have a right to take any of it. Even if you get everybody to vote in your favor. Now. Is it true that people are unequal when they're born? Absolutely. Is it sad that some people are born with lousy parents, let's say, or bad genes? Absolutely it's sad. That sadness does not give you a right to penalize those who are, let's say, more fortunate in that sense. It's not immoral that somebody was born with bad genes or with bad parents. <laughs> Because morality can't apply to that which is not chosen. Right? So it just is. It's a metaphysical fact. It's a fact of reality that we're unequal. I think that's a beautiful thing, by the way. I think it's wonderful that we're unequal, because it would be horrible if we were all the same. And at the end of the day, the only way to establish equality is by doing what? <coughs> How do we establish equality? Yeah. I just wanted to ask you something in regards to what you're saying that we are born. Unequal. Yeah. So my question is, how my capital, <coughs> whatever I'm born with, can it be social capital, uh, material capital, defines our equality. So why these possessions or whatever it is define how equal we are? Because I believe in in my free speech that we're all born equal. <coughs> and if if I'm born with a lot of money because of my father or my mother. And you don't, that doesn't make us unequal, in a way. I, I agree with you. So I think we have to differentiate between two forms of equality. Political equality, equality of rights. I believe in equality of rights. I believe we're all equally free when we're born. we we'll equally have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness when we're born. And in that sense, everybody is born equal. And that's the only sense, in my view, that equality has any meaning. Because the alternative to that is equality of outcome. But you can't attain equality of outcome. We're never going to be the same. So you don't want to take all my money. You want to take some of my money. But we'll still be unequal. Because let's say, let's say I'm smarter than you. I'm just, you know, as a hypothetical, right? Now what are you going to do? I'm smarter than you. How are we going to fix that equality? Now, I can tell you how to fix it. There's only one way to fix it. It, it's, not a, it's not a nice way, and it's not a permanent way, because there will always be inequalities, is you get to kill me. You, well, you, you laugh, but this is the classical example, right? So there was a group, uh, you know, those of you coming tonight will have to hear the story again. There's a famous group of intellectuals who went to study in Paris and learned from the best egalitarian philosophers in the world, the, the predecessors to John Rawls, you know, Sartre and Camus and Diderot and... All these, all these really French, French philosophers. And they decided they wanted equality. And they were going to go to their country and they were going to establish equality. So they, they went back home to their country and they gained political power 
And they said, okay, we're going to create the ideal equal society. And for them, it was equality of outcome, not equality of rights like, like we hold it, right? So what did they do? Well, first they looked at their country and they said, some people live in the city, some people live in the countryside. That's not equal. You have many more opportunities in the city, people in the countryside. So what do you do? Well, they emptied the city. They basically drove everybody out into the countryside. The city became a ghost town. Everybody was out in the, in the countryside. And in the countryside, now they had all these people in the countryside. And they said, wait a minute, they're still not equal. Some people are educated. Some people are intelligent. Some people are better farmers. Some people are better foragers. Foragers is picking berries and nuts because these people are starving now. And they had to run around and pick berries and nuts in order to survive. Some people were good at it. Some people were not. So what did they do? They said, but we want this equality. We want to establish absolute equality. They killed them. So they took everybody who was exceptional. So if you wore glasses, they said you must, be, you must be able to read or you must be educated. That was their proxy. They shot them. Anybody who had glasses was shot. Anybody who had a high school education was shot. Anybody who was a good forager was shot. They killed 40% of their own population. 40%. 2 million people out of a population somewhere between 5 to 6. In the name of what? In the name of John Rawls. In the name of equality. In the name of everybody should be the same. But We're not. It doesn't mean that everybody is the same, right? So for example, if men and women are taught to uh, be equal, then obviously we can't uh, close our eyes <coughs> to the fact that we're all different. So equality means accepting our differences. So you are born with some capital and I'm born without di I'm born with different capital, but we're still equal. So it doesn't make you more terrible. Absolutely. So if you look at the how how these Western societies uh, cultures try to develop the rest of the undeveloped and provocating for the equality in itself, it means that we are not equal and okay, we're gonna help you to be developed like us. So it's not equality itself, right? So I agree with you completely, but some people don't agree with us. Uh, by the way, that by the way that regime was was Pol Pot, and it was Cambodia, and you could look it up. It's the killing fields of Cambodia, and it's a true story. I, none of that was made up. I have to move on. Just a second. Just a, not really bothered, but I just wanted to say that what I'm trying to say is that it's not attained an absolute equality, but taking that, giving that opportunities and advantages to people who do not have the same starting point. The best uh, opportunities and advantages you can give people, the only opportunities and advantages you can give people, is freedom, period. And every that? time you, you take away freedom from somebody in order to give it to somebody else, you are destroying opportunities generally in the culture. So it's a, it's, 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 what you're doing is moving away from the principle of freedom and everybody is worse off. Behind you there, in the corner. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. But let's go back to free speech if we can. Exactly. Yeah. That, that is exactly what I'm going to ask you about. And you very effectively uh, described uh, what is happening right now all around the world in all the countries. Freedom of speech is being suppressed. And the consequences of this uh, process. But you never actually mentioned or expressed your opinion why it is happening. So, why do you think it's happening even in Great such question. countries as the States? Great question. Um, and again, I think the answer is philosophical. I, I think it's happening because we have, as a, as a culture, has as philosophers, rejected the idea of reason. Uh, we train our kids in America, at least. I, I don't know how your educational system works, but in America. In America, the focus is not on thinking. The America, the, the, the whole focus is on feeling. We ask our kids all the time, how are you feeling? Not what are you thinking. We train them to feel. We have elevated emotion to a primary. Emotion today is our tool of cognition. Emotions are the most important thing in our lives. No. Emotions are a consequence of thinking. Emotions come from ideas. They come from conclusions. They come from reason, not the other way around. But if we elevate emotions, if we say emotions are the most important thing, 
then what we need to protect these poor, delicate human beings is from being emotionally upset. If emotion is a tool of cognition, then the fact that I am upset by what you say means what you say is wrong somehow. Because truth is completely subjective, there's no absolute truth. The only way to come up with absolute truth is through reason. Emotions can't lead you to real truth. So it's the elevation of emotion above thinking. And my view is, and the Enlightenment view was, that the only tool of cognition, the only way you learn about the truth outside of yourself, is through your ability to reason, your senses and your mind. And reason has been under attack, primarily by German philosophers, since Immanuel Kant, so since the late 18th, uh, 18th century. Rousseau and Kant start the, 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 the real attack on human reason. And today what you've got is postmodernism that tells you, which is dominant in many of the humanities, which basically says there's no such thing as truth, there's no such thing as reality. All there is is your subjective, emotional view of the world. There's nothing else. And by the way, that emotional, subjective view is determined by your class, your race, your gender, your, you know, fill in the blank. And therefore, we almost aggregate into little groups. Because since emotions are not really tools of cognition, then we need a group to help us with our emotions. And what does a group always have? that ultimately determines the fate of the group. What do groups always have? Authority. Leaders, authority. So this is the path to authoritarianism. This is why collectivism always leads to authoritarianism. Once we view our primary alliance is to the group, the group, how do we know what's good? I, you know, I hate terms like the public interest and the common good. Who gets to decide what the common good is? I mean, do we have a common good? I mean, I think we do in the sense <laughs> of freedom. And, and, and individualism and respecting one another. But beyond that, what is the common good? I mean, half of us want to do X and another half want to do Y. Who gets to decide? Well, one way is to vote, but they don't like voting. Because what about the minorities? A minority, in my view, is the individual, but for them, the minority is whatever group they decide is being oppressed right now. So what you need ultimately is an authority, an authority to channel the will of the, of the group. And that's slippery, very fast slope towards authoritarianism. As you see it in America, I mean, in my view, Trump is, is and, and Obama before him, but particularly Trump, is that slippery slope towards authoritarianism. You, you're seeing it already. Uh, it doesn't matter what he says. It didn't matter what Obama said. The left believed anything Obama said. Anything Obama said, they worship. Now with Trump, he's got his following. They believe anything he says. It doesn't matter if he contradicts himself. It doesn't matter if he blatantly lies. Everything he says is okay. This is, it's all about emotion. It's not about facts. It, we, it, it, I think they call it now post-truth error. Well, I mean, if you don't have truth, then what's speech worth? You know, what's thinking worth? Nothing. Yeah, you've got the mic and then just pass it around. Sure, I want to analyze it. Uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, lies in the environment of freedom of expression. People can express freely their truth and lies. In this uh, post-truth era, uh, how we should cope with the lies and disinformation? Well, I mean, the only way to cope with lies and disinformation is to reveal them, is to argue against them, it's to it's to um, it's to call them out for what they really are. I mean, the only way is to use speech to expose them, and to hope that there's still enough people in the world thinking for themselves who can differentiate between truth and lies. But again, once you give the authority permission to silence the liars, then it's the end of freedom. Because then the authority is going to decide, you are now lying. You know, their, their standard is not necessarily going to be your standard. Their standard is probably their standard, which is power, which most authorities latch on to. So the only way is to speak up against it. And, and it's becoming more and more difficult. I mean, uh, uh, if I do a video and put it up on YouTube about terrorism, YouTube will not allow me to monetize that video. They won't put ads on it because they deem that offensive speech. So it's getting harder and harder to speak up against certain points of view because even, and I think they have a complete right to do it. I'm not objecting to their right to do it. It's a private company. They can do whatever they want. 
but it's becoming more and more difficult to stand up and say, what's being expressed there is false. Here's what I think is true. You guys get to decide. Because we're limited in what and where we can speak. If you, yeah. <coughs> I, I have a question. Thank you for, very much for your very interesting speech, first of all. I have a question more of a, about designing the system. What frequently said about uh, the part when, when I'm offended that the state tries to uh, impose some kind of a rule on me is that, okay, that's kind of a prevention of abiding the law. Uh, in economics, I mean, if we look at Smith or Friedman, or Hayek, they say that there are two roles of the government, right? Protecting society from outside forces, protecting us from each other. Yes. So, what if they say, tell us, someone in EU country or something like that, that okay, the, the reason why I'm stopping this free speech is to prevent the violence, prevent, to protect you from him. It's a good question. I, I don't, so, and they say that. They say that all the time because these people are going to be offended and they're going to rise up and they're going to come after you. By the way, I hear that argument about redistribution of wealth all the time, right? If we don't redistribute wealth to the poor, if we don't take money from the rich and give it to the poor, the poor will rise up and beat us up, right? And they'll come and take the wealth. So we're just protecting you from violence by stealing stuff from you and giving it to them. You cannot penalize the innocent because the guilty might rise up against them. Right? There's no end to that once you begin on that path. So the only role of government is, not, is to protect us from force by doing what? By using force in retaliation. I mean, the whole rule of law is set up in a way as to say, in order for me to use force against you, I have to have proof, solid evidence, that you're about to commit a crime or that you have already committed a crime. So it's not the role of government to, to prevent all violence. In the sense of, I'll give you another example. You know, we could have a curfew. We could say there's a lot of rape going on. And we could say all men have to stay home because men typically commit rape. So we say in order to prevent violence, we're going to have all men forced to stay home so that they can't rape. Right? But that would be absurd because most of us are innocent. You can't penalize the innocent for the sins of the guilty. But what if there is an efficiency argument? What, what I don't buy efficiency it's arguments. It's more efficient to prevent the crime. Sure. Than to so, so it's more efficient to keep men at home than to let, and, and, and therefore reduce the rate of, but I, that's why I'm not an efficiency guy. I don't buy efficiency, I'm not a utilitarian. I think those are bad arguments, and they, 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 they lead to lack of freedom. Now, I happen to believe that the moral is the practical, that morality is also consistent with efficiency. So, I'm not gonna argue efficiency with you, but I believe that if we respect individuals' rights, we also get an optimally efficient solution. Even if I can't tell you in economic terms, exactly what the graphs look like, because I don't think, and this goes to economics, I don't think we can actually model human behavior in that kind of detail to know what is the truly efficient outcome. And therefore, I'm, I'm for rights. I'm for protecting individuals. And all of my experience shows me that when you protect individual rights, you get the most efficient pol uh, economic and political outcome as well. And once you start violating them, slippy slopes do exist uh, 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 um, uh, violations of rights, one begun, do not stop, and you get very inefficient, as well as immoral outcomes as a consequence. Just okay, just to came to the question use, of use why. The mic. Oh, okay, just to came back to the to the question of why. Yes, you mentioned the conservatism and that they take out the reasoning. Okay, that could be partly yeah. the explanation. In my understanding, uh, the roots are deeper. It's uh, have been written in Daniel Bell's Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism. Yeah. And because we have these contradictions, then the question was how to overcome. And there was the free, just three, five, ten, eleven, how much you like ways. Yeah. Because uh, this always, if you have contradictions in the system. Contradictions can't survive. Contradictions yes. can't exist. But I, I, for one, don't believe capitalism involves contradictions. 
So I probably disagree with Bell's book, although I'm not that familiar with it. Um, I, don't believe, I don't believe freedom is a contradiction. I believe capitalism, the essential characteristic of capitalism is individual freedom. It's the protection of individual rights. It's the abolition of violence from society. That's the only role of government. It's abolition of violence and the arbitration of disputes, the final arbitration of disputes. That's it. There's no contradiction there. There's, there, there might be disagreement, but that, that does not create contradictions. I, you know, so I think, it, I mean, part of what is going on, I mean, I think the deep point is this negation of reason. I think that's a much more deeper point philosophically. It's a negation of reason and the adoration of emotion. Uh, but I also think that there are elements in our societies who want authority, who thrive on authority, who, who don't want to think for themselves, who don't want to have to decide for themselves, that they want somebody else to make those decisions for them, somebody else to, to protect them because they're, you know, they're sensitive beings. Uh, I think those authoritarian elements among human beings that have always existed, ultimately, in the 100,000 years that we have known in human history, how much of that have we been free? Like 200. 200. 200. And even then, only a fraction of humanity has been free, even during those 200. So freedom doesn't come easy to human beings. Freedom is not, doesn't come you know, naturally in a sense of it just, we just do it. We tend, there's a strong cultural tendency towards authoritarianism. There's a strong cultural tendency towards letting people tell us what to do and how to do it. And, and I think that that is ancient, it's been around in our culture forever, and that's rearing its ugly head again today. Question. And then we'll move um, back. What do you think, I, I want to hear your opinion about this threat to the free speech which from my point of view comes from this strange uh, language which is becoming more and more not understandable. I'm yeah. talking about this politically correct language. Yes. What, what is your opinion on What is the threat? Well, I think again this is, this is uh, authoritarians trying to restrict what we can say. And, and it's, it's being called over the, you know, it's the, the term being used is politically correct. I don't know who exactly gets to decide what's politically correct and who what isn't. I guess it's university professors. Now, I always thought university professors were the most influential people in the world, and I think, I think you are, because you shape future generations. But it, it's, it's determined at the universities, and there's certain things now that are not acceptable speech. To, 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 now look, certain things are indeed offensive. Certain things are indeed evil and, and wrong and, and, and so on. And if I'm running a classroom, there's certain things that I don't want you to say because it's in my classroom and it's irrelevant or it's untrue. But you can't generalize that, you can't force that on a whole community. And that's what they're trying to do through political correctness through, and, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor, for another very interesting lecture. Thank you. So, unfortunately, I have to start with a short comment and totally attest to what you said about actually lack of free speech in the United States in many Western societies. I unfortunately experienced it firsthand on several occasions when I was teaching in the United States uh, last year on a number of univer um, universities. So, um, okay, uh, first of all, my I think it's an like easy question and then like more complicated. Easy question, isn't this identity politics and group politics is a direct effort to individualism, one of the main pillar of uh, of the Western civilization. So yes. all these, uh, all these actually politically correctness speech, all these identity politics, like all these victimology sort of poker, yeah. sometimes actually people are not, it's no longer meritocracy, it's like uh, competition is who is more like victimized. And victimized sometimes belong to a certain group. So minority, uh, so racial minority, ethnic minority, like sexual minority, so everything is becoming actually part of the sort of victimology poker. Absolutely, and, and look, is it direct affront? It's, it's like against individualism. It's a direct affront against individualism, and it's true on the right as well as the left. I, you know, the alt right today, which identifies itself as white and European and white nationalism or white whatever, is just as despicable and disgusting and horrific as it is on the left, where you know this subgroup of transgender blacks, you know, is more victimized than I don't know. Uh, black males, black males victimize black females, but you know, it's, there's a whole hierarchy now. It's called intersectionality, where you have all these sub-little groups, and each one is 
They're rated and ranked, and who's the bigger victim? I mean, this is all sick in my view. It is, is anti-these fundamental values. It's certainly anti-individualism. It's anti-reason, because reason suggests that we should treat people as individuals and what they say based on whether it's true or false, not based on the color of their skin, not based on their gender. This is, goes back to equality, right? It's, it, you don't care if somebody says if they're female or male, or transgender for all that matters. What you care about is what they're saying, true or not true. That's what matters, right? All of that is an affront to, to the idea both of reason and individualism. And a little bit like a harder question yes, about uh, public education and certain minor or well, maybe limited development of the state. Maybe, uh, don't you think that many potentially very talented people are being lost because of the insufficient like, public education? No, uh, it, well, so that's actually an easy so question. Many gems might be lost. But that's a much really, easier. Really very that's a, people because kind of they're born yeah. in. That, that's a much easier question, but a more controversial answer, even though it's an easy answer. No, I think that what we have today in America, you know, I'm not going to talk to for other countries because, although I think this is universal, you can universalize this. The reason there are people today who are so badly educated, the reason there's so many people today that are disadvantaged because of their education, is because of public education. Public education is a disaster. Public education cripples the mind because it's run by bureaucrats, it's not run by teachers. You have no profit motive in education. Imagine, if you had, imagine that instead of uh, the next entrepreneur designing a, a stupid app for, the, for you know, the next Angry Birds or whatever it is for the iPhone, instead of that, they applied their mind and their um, entrepreneurial ability to figuring out how to create a better, more efficient school, how to educate people better. Imagine if you had competition and innovation in the field of education. I mean, then you would have better opportunities for people. People who are smart would rise up much faster. People who are not so smart would still get a basic education that, that was helpful to them. Otherwise, they wouldn't buy the product. Imagine education treating parents as customers instead of the teacher's union as the customer, which it is in the United States, right? Teacher's union, rule education, instead of the parents. And you don't have choice. You get to send your, 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 your kid goes to school X by geographic design. What if my kid doesn't want to go to school? What if I don't want to send my kid to the school? Tough, right? So I want the complete and utter 100% privatization of education. I think that was where you would have real opportunities for kids. That's when ability, and you talked about meritocracy. I don't like the term meritocracy, but that's where ability would determine how far you would advance. And if you're worried about how many kids uh, we couldn't afford that education. First of all, I think when you have competition, prices come down. We know this from every other field, and education could be much cheaper than it is today and much better. But also, I always ask audiences, how many of you would be willing to support, like a foundation that I started, or anybody would start, to support giving scholarships to poor kids to go to school? And everybody raises their hand. So it's easy to raise money for that cost. It's not hard. So, Every kid would get an education, it would be a far, 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 far superior education to what we have today when the state, remember the state, George Washington said in one of his speeches, the state is a gun, the state is force, the state is authority. You don't want a gun, you don't want force, you don't want authority in the classroom. What you want in the classroom is education. You're not going to get that with the state-run system. And that's true in Europe, that's true in America. If you had real competition, you can't imagine how good education could be given, given the technology we have today, given how much we know about the human mind, it would be a hundred times better than it was a hundred years ago. Whereas by most objective measures, our educational system today is worse than it was a hundred years ago. Who's got the mic? Go ahead. I want to go back to US examples that you mentioned in your speech. Yeah. So if media criticizes the Trump president, uh, yeah. so that's okay, that's free speech. Yes. But it's not okay if Trump expressed his own personal idea and said that that That's media right. is biased. Right. So what's wrong with that if he does not do anything illegal? So what's wrong that he as a person uh, he expresses personal ideas? We all as an individuals, we have our position. Sure. So sure. Does our position in a society prevent us expressing our own ideas? So it does when you're in the government, absolutely. So Trump? As real estate billionaire, can say whatever he wants to say, can accuse anybody of anything, can, a, 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 but as president of the United States, he has a gun. He might point it at you, he might just hold it like this and look at you. 
But you know that gun is pointed, and he said it, so he has said. This is how stupid, I mean, <coughs> uh, we're taping. Trump is, in my view, right? Has he done anything to ban those? Well, people? think about this. He has said that he's going to go after Amazon for being a monopoly. And in the same sentence, he said, you know, and they own the Washington Post, and I don't like the Washington Post. So when the Justice Department goes after Amazon, is that an attempt to silence the Washington Post? Isn't it an attempt? Do we know? How can we tell? A very, very, very dangerous when a president starts threatening the media, starts accusing some in the media versus others in the media. I mean, <coughs> again, as a private citizen, you can do it all. But once you have a gun, once you are in uniform, as president of the United States, commander in chief of the military, you can't just speak as a private citizen. You now represent the official view of the U.S. government. The official view of the U.S. government of the media is zero. They don't have an official view. The official view of the U.S. government of the U.S. media is they're free to say whatever they want. Freedom of the press. That's the only position that a, that a, that a government official has. Privately, say whatever he wants. But, but when he's doing a press conference as president of the United States, no. All right, and then this guy here. So I'm just going to be really quick. And uh, so today you talked about the uh, free speech, which is, <clears throat> I think, what our society needs is individuality right yes. now. So I just want to give example, for example, on the my house free speech uh, works, and to ask the question how to actually have the power to stand up for yourself, because ultimately I have experienced experience it on myself that how. It's not only about the authority, right? It's about the social norms that govern us. And uh, that, for example, I didn't have the mic now and I wanted to say something, right? So ultimately, the free speech or somebody who can be heard, you need some resources, right? You need some. So if I'm somebody who, is, who doesn't have any possessions, any, not even mic to, to use to, uh, to speak up, right? So my individuality is just. Uh, kind of doesn't exist. So how do I survive in this society uh, where to stand up for yourself? Can you give us some tips how to do that and to express your opinion even though it may sound crazy for other people? So the idea of free speech does not mean you have a right to the mic. It means that you have a right to say on your time, in, on your property, on, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, with your means and your ability whatever you want, and nobody has a right to use force against you. It doesn't mean you have a right to block traffic in a demonstration and, and, uh, and violate other people's property rights or freedom of movement rights or anything else. It means that you have the ability to speak when you have the ability to speak, and if you don't have it, you don't have it. If you don't have the mic, you don't have the mic. Now, I would say that the most important thing in terms of individuality, in terms of expressing yourself, is to have courage. It is, I know there are social norms. I know that people put social pressure on you. But you got to, if you believe in something strongly, you got to speak up. You got to, you know, social norms are meant to be broken. You know, all advancement is, is created by people who've broken social norms. So you got to be brave and you got to stand up. And the more you believe in something, the more something is important to you, the more you invest in making sure your voice is heard the more you invest in speaking up. So regarding being heard, you need the mic, right? That was my, so you can say, I can say something, but I'm not going to be heard at all. But if I have some resources that I'm... You don't have a way to be heard. You have a way to speak. You don't have a way to be heard. I, 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 it, it's not my, I don't have an obligation, it's not my, I'm not obliged to hear everybody who wants to say something. I can actually, if you come to my Facebook page, I can accept you as a friend or not. Now you can say, wait a minute, if you're not accepting me as a friend, you won't hear what I have to say. True. There's no obligation on me to hear what you have to say. You have the right to say it on your Facebook page. I don't have, a, I don't have an obligation to go find it and see it. Right? So that creates bubbles. Well, social media creates bubbles, I agree. And it's a problem. It's a real problem. But, but there's no way to force us out of those bubbles. We have to be, it's our personal responsibility to break out of the bubbles. I purposefully follow people on Twitter and Facebook who I disagree with because I want to see what they're saying, and I want to see what their arguments is. And I don't ban people who argue with me unless they're really, 
really obnoxious, uh, who, uh, uh, on, on Facebook and Twitter. But that's a personal choice. If you want to live in a bubble, you have a right to live in a bubble. You don't have a right to impose yourself on other people. But in the bubble, you, don't have, you have no idea about other I know. things. I know, so don't, so don't be in a bubble. You know, but that's up to you. You don't know that you're in a bubble when you're well, in a bubble. Well, you, everybody knows they're in a bubble based on, on, the, on the fact that they're getting this feedback. It's an echo chamber.